subject, God and the Father. A lot of controversy among churches about how many there are in the Godhead. Uh, I know a lot of people are confused about stuff. A lot of people read the Bible and don't understand some of what's in it. And part of it is just the fact that it's been translated. Uh, I do word searches a lot of time to try to understand what they're talking about. And someone said, well, you're adding to or taking away from the Word of God. Now, I'll be honest. In the process of translating something, you're losing something. And you might actually have stuff in there that seems like it's adding to it, but it's not. So it's a good idea. If I studied Greek and Hebrew and Chaldean and all that, I probably still wouldn't understand it exactly right <clears throat> because our culture is so much different than theirs but when you understand what their words actually mean it helps us to understand where the translators were coming from as they translated the word of God hallelujah yeah. so perhaps I can kind of clear up some of the misunderstanding about how many persons there are in the Godhead now the early church taught there was only one person in the Godhead. You know, I'm not going to try to get into baptism in Jesus' name or whatever, but for right now, it's kind of hard for me not to get into it, but for right now, the early church taught there was only one person in the Godhead. At the Council of Nicaea in Constantinople, in the middle of the second century, they determined there were three persons in the Godhead. And someone said, well, where do you get this information? Well, you can look up a lot of this stuff online. There are a lot of records. The Romans were meticulous record keepers. So if you're uh, wanting to look up something like what transpired in uh, Paul with Pilate and Jesus, you can also find out that Jesus was there more than once. He was there before that also, talking to Pilate. Uh, when Pilate first became you know, the governor over that area, uh, he was checking out Jesus because rumors were going around that this man was going to try to set up a kingdom there on earth. And he was checking it out, and he reported back to Rome that this man is no threat to the Roman government. He has no intention of trying to overthrow Rome. Uh, but it went on. But you can say it's kind of crazy, but all this information is there. If you want to know about Herod, he had to give an account of why he had all the children killed from the ages of three years old down. He told a big old lie, you know, why he did it. But uh, you can find all that information because they kept it. Now, there's a library of the Vatican in Rome, owned by the Catholics, and there's the Mosque of St. Sophia in Constantinople, owned by the Muslims, and uh, Mohammed overthrew the Romans they were going to burn all these records, and Muhammad said, oh, no, 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 this is too valuable a history to destroy. So they kept it. And the Catholics wound up with part of it, the Romans wound up part of it, but just before the Muslims had conquered Rome, the Catholics had moved in at the death of the last of the apostles, claiming apostolic succession. And like I said, you want to, where do you get all this stuff? You can look this stuff up on the internet. Uh, you can access it through these libraries. They won't let you touch anything. And I don't really know how they get a hold of it online. The people that I've got the information from actually went there and requested the information, and they bring it out to you. 
<coughs> but this information is available. Hallelujah. So how many are in the Godhead? So I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20. Hallelujah. <coughs> How many are in the Godhead? I'll just read some verses here. Chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To me, that looks like there's three. Colossians 1 and 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praying always for you. Let's just read these. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. James 1 and 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And that's a good verse right there, keeping himself unspotted from the world. And I, I might actually do it with that this evening. But uh, God and the Father, hallelujah. And then in 2 Corinthians 13 and 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Now you look through scriptures and you see this separated and all, lots of places you see that it mentions the Father and the Son or Jesus and the Father. It mentions God and the Father and it talks about God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. You know, like it's separate persons. And a lot of people like can understand why you get confused. There's situations like when Jesus was baptized and he got a voice from heaven, the spirit remaining, descending and remaining over Jesus while he's in the water. Well, there has to be at least three, and I can understand how that gets confusing. But hopefully by the time I'm done here this morning, we'll have an understanding of just really how many there are in the Godhead. Okay? So are there one, two, three, or four persons in the Godhead? You know, the majority of the religious world says there are three. I've met people that said there's only two. Apostolic churches say there's only one. Hallelujah. But by the same reasoning used by the council at Constantinople to determine there were three persons in the Godhead, you would have to say by the verses that I've just read there were four persons in the Godhead. So why does it look like that? You know, so many questions that arise. And I know... All this can be confusing. So what's the answer? We well, gotta look at the Word of God. Hallelujah. I've said it many times before that you interpret the book by the book. You want to know what's truth in Scripture, you can only judge it by the Word of God. Okay? So instead of just beating around the bush, I'm gonna just come out and make a statement and prove it. There is only one person in the Godhead. The only person you will ever see pertaining to the Godhead is Jesus Christ. The only body you'll ever see, the only face you'll ever see, the only voice you'll ever hear is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And Jesus is the only body, the only bodily form you'll ever see of God. There are not three persons in the Godhead. There are three dispensations in which God manifests himself in three different ways. All right? In creation, he is the father of all that exists. All right? In redemption, he is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The one they were that was foretold, the holy one that would come. The one that was told that he would be born of a woman and redeem mankind back to God that his sins can be forgiven. The sin of Adam and Eve even. All right? And in sanctification, he is the Holy Ghost. You cannot come into the presence of God with that original sin in your life. I know some preachers go as far as say, the only prayer that God will hear of sinners is a prayer for repentance. No, God hears every single prayer. He knows there's too many places in the Bible 
Well, there were non-Jews that Jesus heard them and healed them and gave them a miracle. All right? But the only way we can come into the presence of God, if we die, and the only way we can go into the presence of God is if we're sanctified. If these sins are washed away. That original sin is gone. All right? And I dealt with this a little bit, you know, last Thursday on everlasting life. All those souls that had died before the cross were just laying there waiting. The Jews taught that there was an eternal place of eternal, you know, rest, and there's a place of eternal torment. It's the parable of Lazarus and uh, the beggar, you know, and the rich man. Lazarus saw, I mean, you see, the rich man was looking up and saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. That's what they believe actually happened when you died. But that's not going to heaven, all right? And that after the cross, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. That is for believers, all right? So the Holy Ghost sanctifies us and leads us and guides us into all truth. It's what keeps us in a saved condition. It's what checks us when we get out of line. All right? Now, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, okay? For there are three, one, two, three, that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. See, you know, it says plainly there's three. All right? But now, it doesn't stop there. It says, and these three are, are, they are one. All right? Hallelujah. Now, if there is only one person in the Godhead, then why do the disciples continue wording things in this way? So, for an example, let's look at a verse we already read in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. All right? Why do they keep talking like this? Let's read the verse. 2 Corinthians 13 and 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Why do they keep wording it like that? If there's only one person in the Godhead, why is he mentioning three here? All right? It's because they understood the purposes of these offices. All right? The love of God that hath appeared unto all of you. Okay? It also says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish and not, that he might have everlasting life. God so loved the world, and I hope I'm making sense out of this. He loved Adam and Eve so much that when they messed up, he made provision that they could be redeemed by him. And he told Mary, uh, Eve in the garden that through childbearing, mankind would be redeemed back unto him. And that's where Jesus came in. All right? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ that hath appeared unto all men. That's God's unmerited favor. It's not that you've done anything so great and so mighty that God said, well, I think we're going to give this one a chance for salvation. No. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants every single person that's ever been born to be saved. But he's not going to force them. They have a choice. All right? With the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, hath appeared unto all men. Hallelujah. He wants us to be saved. And then it says, And the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Can you see what he's saying? That God so loved the world. He wants us to take advantage of the God that loves the world. The Son that was God himself manifested in the flesh. That would give his grace and give us an opportunity to be saved. And then we could obtain the communion of the Holy Ghost. So let me let me word this in another way. Let me put this in modern day English. If we were giving this greeting to somebody right now, okay? <coughs> Having obtained the love of God by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, stay saved by the communion of the Holy Ghost. Those are the offices. God is the Father of all creation, everything living. There's nothing made that wasn't made by Him. 
What is it? The book of John 1. In the beginning was Word, and the Word was God. Hallelujah. In the beginning was Word, Word was, was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And by Him, all things were made. I'm, I'm, you have to read it, I guess, but all things were made. And by Him, all things consist. That's talking about Jesus. Not that He's the second person in the Godhead. In the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was Logos. Is the Greek word that was used there. And it can be translated, in the beginning was the thought. And the thought was with God. And the thought was God. In the beginning was the plan. The plan was with God. The plan was God. In the beginning was the concept. The concept was with God. And the concept was God. All right? So in the beginning, God, still Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Having obtained the love of God by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Stay saved by the communion of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I don't know if that makes any sense to you or, or not, but they weren't acknowledging that there was three persons in the Godhead. They were acknowledging what you have to do to stay saved. Hallelujah. It's the love of God that brings us in. It's the grace of Jesus Christ that gave us a chance for redemption. And I've went through this before about how there had to be spotless human blood shed to redeem us of our sins. And there's no way that could happen by a man and a woman. It could only happen by God himself and a woman. Hallelujah. You know, they're talking about, and maybe, maybe I'm going off here on something, but they say that uh, they're developing this AI technology to where an artificial human could actually carry a baby. <coughs> It would have to be work with scientists, but they say that everything you need to produce the male and the female genes to make a human being is contained in the male DNA. The female DNA doesn't have enough to do it all by herself. All right? So basically, when the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, they eliminated man out of the picture. All right? And it was just God and Eve that created a human child that has spotless human blood. And that blood could be shed to save us from our sins. And that's Jesus Christ. The Bible plainly says that God is a spirit. You can't see his spirit. Hallelujah. And if it makes it any more plain, uh, sometimes I explain it like this. The only soul that Jesus Christ ever had was God himself dwelling in that body. Hallelujah. Okay. In John chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus was talking to, to the Jews, the rulers, the priests, and uh, they want to stone him to death. Okay? And he was trying to explain who he was. You know, they think, tell him, you're getting out of place. You're making yourself, by claiming you're the son of God, you're making yourself God himself. And he was. And Jesus wasn't beating around the bush anymore. He was trying to explain to him. But they should have already ascertained from studying the scriptures. But in John chapter 10 and verse 37, if I do the works of my Father, or if I do not, okay, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the time right there. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you're not going to believe me anyway, is what he's saying. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The Father is in me and I in him. Hallelujah. Let me get a little bit more interesting here in a minute. John chapter 14 and verse 10 says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. That dwelleth in me. Hallelujah. All the Spirit of God dwelt in the body of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He doeth the works. John chapter 14, the very next verse, verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. I mean, come on. 
What did Nicodemus tell him? No man can see, do these things that we see you do except the be of God. God only can do these things. What did they tell him when he told that man that was, you know, had the withered arm, your sins be forgiven you? Blasphemy! Only God can forgive sins. And he said, I'm telling you, putting it in my words. The Son of Man hath power to forgive sin right here on earth. Because he is God himself manifested in the flesh. He's not a third person. There's not three people. Hallelujah. Jesus plainly said that God, God is a spirit. And he also said that a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. He also said a spirit can't sit down and eat this fish before you. Hallelujah. Okay. Father and the Father in me. John 14. Let's go to verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, what day is he talking about? After the resurrection. At that day. He's not talking about the last day at the end of the earth. He said, at that day, Ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. At that day, I'm, I want to just remember that, at that day, because I'm going to bring this back up, right? John chapter 17 and verse 21, that they all might be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. How can you be one in us? Is there not two? No, there's not. Hallelujah. I understand that God the Father, which is the Spirit, dwelt in the body of Jesus Christ. And we, which are little offshoots of God, where did our soul come from? God breathed into the nostrils of man, and he became a living soul. And all those spirits are going back to God. The Bible says the spirit of a beast, when it dies, returns to the earth from whence it came. But the spirit of a man returns to God who gave it. We are the body of Christ, literally, right here on earth. Not just spiritually. We are spiritually and physically. And just like Jesus is God, spiritually and physically, we're going to be one. Just like they're one. I'm going to be with him. But up to this point, the 12 disciples did not really understand the Godhead. All right? Though Jesus plainly told them many times, you can see it again and again and again through the Gospels. Hallelujah. He tried to explain this to them, and they just could not get it. He told Peter, you know, that he was going to die on the cross. And Peter was like, no way. And Jesus had to tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know what spirit you're of. Hallelujah. They just would not accept, accept it, could not grasp it, could not wrap their head around it, however you want to word it. But up to this point, the twelve did not really understand the Godhead. Though Jesus plainly told them many times, I really don't think they quite grasped this until after the resurrection. And that's what I'm talking about when I said, at that day. At that day. What happened at that day? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. All right. After his resurrection, it says that to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. And at this point, Jesus made sure they understood the Godhead. They understood exactly who he was. They understood exactly how he wanted the church set up. Hallelujah. They weren't confused on the day of Pentecost when they said, men and brethren, what must we do? And they quoted Acts 2.38 that we quote so often. They understood at that day what they, he wanted them to do. All right. Praise God. Now, John chapter 14 and verse 1. And I'm going to read all the way down through verse 11. Probably stopping some on the way. It's a familiar story. Hallelujah. 
Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now he's explained this again and again. If you can't grasp the fact that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, just believe me for the very work's sake, okay? Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I didn't want to go off on this for a pretty good while, but in his Father's house are many mansions. We're not going there. And I know this just kind of blows your mind about traditional teachings on heaven. But you're not going to go to heaven and find uh, a mansion built just for me and a mansion built just for you. Okay? You're not going to go to heaven and you're not going to find that city built four square with 12 foundations. I mean, all these things are symbolic. It's just like the great white throne judgment that I dealt with Thursday. You're not going to stand before the throne and have everything you've ever done in your life read out to you and give you a chance to make excuses for it. That ain't happened. When you die, you went through the great white throne judgment. When you die, you're judged then. You're either a sheep or a goat. And if you come up in the first resurrection, you're saved. If you come up in the second resurrection, Jesus said, you're damned. It was the resurrection of the damned. And that second resurrection is going to happen after the thousand-year reign. The first resurrection happens when he's coming back and we, the dead in Christ, shall rise and they that are alive and remain will ascend to meet him in the air. That's the first resurrection. Then we come back down for the thousand year reign after the wrath of the seven seal is poured out. And then after that thousand years, the devil's going to be loosed and the dead and the resurrection of the damned are going to be raised up and come against the camp of the saints. But there's not going to be no battle. We're leaving here and all this is going to be engulfed in fire. We're going to a new heaven and a new earth. All right? So a lot of these things are symbolic. You're not, you don't see these things. What, what's heaven going to be like then? I've got no idea. I'll be honest. All I know is that it's going to be beautiful and wonderful beyond our wildest imaginations. Behind our wildest hopes, it's going to be so much better than anything we've seen down here. But how do you describe something to somebody that they've never seen? Go off to a third world country and try to explain to one of them kids what ice cream is. Well, they don't even know what a refrigerator is, let alone some way to freeze it. I mean, I mean you, you try to come up with different things to explain it to them, and that's what's going on when they explain it heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But uh, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let me get back. I won't chase rabbits too much here. In my Father's house are many mansions. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? <laughs> There's folks already there. Those mansions are already there. Hallelujah. Praise God. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'd go to prepare a place for you. Now, he went and prepared that place when he died on the cross and resurrected himself. All right? Hallelujah. He made it possible that we could go and be in the very presence of God. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you're sanctified, and you're in a condition that you can go into the presence of God. All right? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know. And the way, ye know. Now, Thomas here, he was pretty confused with the situation. Tom, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. <clears throat> he had no idea where he was going. He didn't really have any idea what he was talking about. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said, or saith unto him, I and the way. Well, they didn't understand this yet. The truth and the life. He is the way to heaven. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the truth. There's only one truth in the Word of God. He is the truth. Hallelujah. The way, the truth, and eternal life comes only through Him. 
because he was the one that conquered death, hell, and the grave. I am the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. I said, the scriptures that I just kept, I just got through reading, he's trying to explain to them again and again and again. The Father dwells in him. Okay, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Now this got Philip all confused. And saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Now I know Jesus probably acted surprised right here, but he knew they didn't grasp it yet. And he knew they wouldn't grasp it completely until after his resurrection. But Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? God is a spirit. You can't see him unless he manifests himself in some form. Verse 10 says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? All right? The words that I speak, I speak unto you. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth, that dwelleth in me. He doeth the words. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. No one can do these things but God. How can you think I'm anybody else? You think I'm just some prophet like Elijah that's come down, and I can raise the dead back to life and all these other things? Hallelujah. That I can control the storms instantly, make the sea and the wind just go, Pum. okay. He said, stifle it. So they do. How can this be? That I am in the Father and the Father in me. The Bible explains it. The disciples understood it. If you go to Colossians 2 and 9, it said, For in him, talking about Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God is it's the same God that said, Beside me, there is no God. There's not a second and third person or a fourth person. Spirit or otherwise, he said, there is no God beside me. There's no exception to the rule. He's the only God. Colossians chapter 1, back up a chapter in verse 19, it said, For it pleased the Father, talking about Jesus Christ again, that in him should all the fullness dwell. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. And the Bible declares it again and again and again. Yet people are so confused because they don't, have the revelation of God in Christ. Hallelujah. They don't want to grasp the revelation. And it comes to a revelation. Until it just until God just opens it up to you. I, I, I got in church and I believed what was preached. I got the Holy Ghost was baptized in Jesus' name. And I'd still read the Bible and say, How can you get something other than two or three out of this? And it wasn't until God opened up the door and revealed to me. You got to understand the offices. You got to understand what God was doing from the beginning all the way to the end. There's a big picture. He had a plan. Hallelujah. He knew Adam and Eve would mess up. He knew he would create a way for them to be redeemed unto him. And that it had to be spotless blood shed for their redemption. He knew people on their own couldn't live for him. That's why the law was really such a disaster. Paul said it was a burden. Jesus referred to it as a burden. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. He gives us the Holy Ghost that leads us and guides us and directs us and helps us understand when we're getting out of line. Hallelujah. It pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. And you could word it as all the fullness of the Godhead dwell in him bodily. Jeremy, if you would, you would let them go and wind us up. Be a little short winded. I make nobody mad at that. But John chapter 12 and verse 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, 
Believe is not on me. In other words, you're not believing on this flesh. All right? But on him that sent me, the spirit that dwells in him, if you want to word it that way. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. That's pretty plain. Hallelujah. John chapter 5 and verse 37. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Yea, have ye have never heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Why not? Because he's a spirit. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, and ye believe not. And he said, verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think. That means you could think wrong. That means you could be mistaken. Ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures. It paints it plainly. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and believe there's three in the Godhead, but you can't be saved that way. If you want to go by that route to determine how many is in the Godhead, you're going to have to say there's four. Because there's God and the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it just don't make sense not to mention that the early church baptized only in the name of Jesus. The early church taught only that there was one person in the Godhead. It was changed after what is now the Catholic Church came in claiming apostolic succession and took over and scattered the true believers. Hallelujah. Search the scriptures for anything you think you have eternal life. And I'm just going to add one more thing. There are some that say the Old Testament doesn't count to us anymore. And it doesn't pertain to us. Well, I got a question. Seeing that the book of Matthew was written 40 years after the death of Christ. And Paul is telling them, search the scriptures. And he's preaching Christ to them. Preaching salvation to them out of the scriptures. What scripture was he using? Because the New Testament didn't exist. He had to use the Old Testament scriptures. How did Paul determine that Jesus was the Christ? Because there was so much there pointing plainly who the Christ would be and how he would come. Yeah, they thought some king was going to have a son and his son was going to take over and then they are going to rise up in an army and destroy Rome. didn't happen that way. And that ain't what the scripture said either. Meek and lonely, riding on an ass, a coat full of an ass. Hallelujah. He wasn't coming. And so beautiful, you know, magnificent woman. Hallelujah. To us, he's beautiful. He died on the cross and took our place that we could go to be with God forever. Praise God. So stand with me. I'm going to let us go. And I hope somebody got something out of this. There's too many people really that don't quite understand the Godhead. Praise God. <coughs> Let's remember those we've been praying for. Asper, Terry, Frank, Mike, and Caitlin, Sister Nancy, Catherine. Nancy, Nancy, what? Catherine. Catherine. Praise God. Lucy and Felicia's Uncle Ronnie. <coughs> Hallelujah. And each and every one of us here today. Praise God. We love you, Jesus. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you, Jesus, and thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. And thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, to hear your word. I ask you, Lord, to minister to us and help us to gain understanding and knowledge of your word. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do. You are great, Lord. You're great to be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. We can be dismissed in Jesus' name. But I forgot to ask. What did you all study this morning? Take your prayer. Praise. Don't let the battle steal your praise. All right. That's good. Got to worship God. Amen. This is Mr. Jesus. We used the story of Moses when they held up his hands.